conversations that you know you think about for months, years after. A uh, great moment of the college. There are so many great moments. Every student I meet. People are starting to become interested in the idea of eating insects, not only in terms. That really shaped the rest of my existence in every possible way. My name is Martin Bell and I was at King's between 1959 and 1962. When I came to King's, I thought I was living a dream. Uh, the building's so majestic, it was like stepping into a little bit of history. Then I realised it was a live organisation and a buzz with ideas. English was the easy option for me to study. But I fell into broadcasting where, where words are so important and, uh, and cadences. And I think the time that I spent both in the college library and in the university library were immensely useful later in life. I was very lucky. I found a side door through somebody I knew uh, into the BBC in Norwich. This was a time when obviously you didn't have to be good looking to get a job in television news. But it was a time when the reporting staff was very small. And I don't know how it is now, but in those days coming out of King's College with a, with a good degree did, did open a few doors. But after that, you have to open them yourself. So I would say that the college gave me a very good start. Well, within 10 years of being in the army in Cyprus on active service, uh, I was covering wars in uh, the Middle East, Arab, first Arab-Israeli war, the 67 war, and, uh, and, and Vietnam. So actually having been a, a soldier was quite useful. But I think that the three years at King's also matured me in a way that I needed to be matured. Otherwise, the danger is you get too excited by war. So from the regiment, I learned the art of staying alive in dangerous places. And from the college, I learned the art of thinking for myself. The technology of television news changed exponentially. We used to put cans of exposed news film onto aircraft, air freight them to London, long before satellites. At the end, we were satelliting. I changed too, I went on a long journey. I started as a fairly thoughtless young man, in spite of King's College, Cambridge. I was quite interested in wars and ranks and, 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 and military weapon systems. About 15 years later, I realized, and King's helped me on this, that wars are about people. And I used to take with me the poems of Wilfred Owen, who wrote his head of war and the pity of war. So what I tried to show was the pity of war and the wastefulness of war. And I would like to think it had a little bit of an impact. In journalism, you always find people you want to admire and emulate. Uh, mine was a great uh, correspondent called Charles Wheeler, and another one for the News Chronicle, when I was at King's where the News Chronicle f uh, folded, that was uh, James Cameron. Then you develop your own style, what's, what's, what's right for you, and TV news is a strange medium. The sort of English I learned here would never, would never work in television news, because. First of all, you drop the adverbs and the adjectives because your pictures are your adverbs and adjectives. Towards the end, I was, uh, I was dropping the verbs as well. So it was mostly um, staccato delivery, just doing, shall we say, the words to the music of the story. King's taught me to think for myself. And one of the things I thought for myself is that the old fashioned idea of neutrality, on the one hand this, on the other hand that, only time will tell, was nonsense. I rejected it. And I developed something which I called the journalism of attachment, which is not neutral between good and evil, between the unarmed and the armed, between the aggressor and the victim. And I think that's the right way to look at it. And I'm sure that my education here had something to do with it. Absolutely, what I rebelled against about halfway through my career was what I call bystander journalism. 
especially because television news became so influential, that we have an impact on what we report, on the situation. So you've got to be very responsible, very careful with the facts. But there's no case for just sort of standing back and saying it's none of my business, especially for journalists in a war zone, it's every bit of our business. I think I've, uh, I've been in and around um, 18 wars, and I was only ever wounded in one of them, which was Bosnia in what, um, 92. I've had a lot of friends who did not survive it. Don McCullen, who's an old mate, was badly wounded twice, once I think in Cambodia and once alongside me in El Salvador. But I think it's a job that somebody has to do. We need someone to bear witness for the world outside. And there's never a shortage of people wanting to do it. I was just very lucky to be one of them. And one of the things that kept me at it was this, you have a wonderful sense of comradeship in the war zones. You become the closest of mates with people whom you would cross the street to avoid in civilian life. And they ask it, me, do, do you miss it? I don't miss the wars, but I miss the comradeship. There were some really good journalists out there reporting the wars, but everything changed for us since 9-11. The worst thing that could happen in my generation, you'd be caught in the crossfire of somebody else's war. Today, you can be kidnapped, ransomed, maybe put in an orange jumpsuit and executed. And that has driven the journalists back from the war zones. So that the wars of Africa today, and there are three or four of them going on, are to a large extent fought in conditions of medieval obscurity. What has happened is that foreign news is expensive and sometimes dangerous. And since the development of the internet, news editors have discovered a notion of what people watch more of and what they watch less of. They, they don't watch much foreign news. Hence, I think, the celebrification of the news agenda. There's a war going now in the Republic of the Congo, of which you knew nothing. But if a Kardashian gets robbed at gunpoint in Paris, that's going to be the lead story. It's just the way things are. News is expensive and most news outlets, not the BBC, are there to make money. They'll make money from whatever sells. So I think there's been a general drift down market in the news agenda. I regret that, but there are still some organisations, serious newspapers, BBC, ITV News, others, who do take the world seriously and sometimes report it at considerable risk to their camera people and reporters. We live in an age of fake news where the whole of journalism is discredited, not only by the president occupant of the White House, but by others with political agendas. We are in a situation now where the lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on. So we've got to get real about this and reverse it. I think one of the lessons of the 1930s was never underrate the power of the demagogue. Imagine what Hitler would have done, who had at the time only print, radio and the cinema to work with, what he could not have achieved in the age of the internet. That worries me a lot. I had no intention whatever of going into Parliament, but I think King's College instilled in me a profound sense of curiosity. And when I was approached, the approach came to me, by the then opposition parties, Lib Dem and Labour, to take on Neil Hamilton in Tatton in 1997, I thought to myself, why not? And when I got in Parliament, guess who I found? A fellow Kingsman, Tam Diel, the father of the House, who started, he tells you a lot about Kings, he started off as the president of the University Conservative Association and he ended up as a Labour MP. Something about Kings, it makes you question uh, established opinions and received opinions. And uh, when I got to the House of Commons, 
I, I remembered my time in Kings. There were a few Kingsmen there. They tended to be of the tribe of the independent-minded. So actually I would think journalism was a help to me because I could put out a press release without even trying. But also Kings was helpful because when I sat on the green benches as the only independent, I had already been taught to think independently. Because I was the first independent, this was 97, I think the other independents all left. They were in the university seats until 1950 or 51. Um, these, the, the party MPs, and they were all party MPs except for me, they were actually very helpful. They, they helped me out. They didn't regard me as a great, as a great um, a, a, a challenge to the system. I was, a, I was an oddity and a peculiarity, and they wanted my support in their early day motions. So socially, I had a very good time in the House of Commons. Uh, politically, it was a bit of a shock. I wasn't ready for the power of the whips. I should have been, but I had the great advantage of being my own chief whip. The whip system troubles me a lot. I believe that we have to have parties. You can't have government without parties, but it has to be a degree of independent thinking within parties. And I found it, especially when we went to war in 2003 in Iraq with an entirely inadequate grounds. There you saw the power of the party system at its worst. So I was actually quite pleased and privileged to sit for four years in the House of Commons without having a political party telling me what to do. I was told when I arrived that the behaviour of MPs, which is pretty dreadful at PMQ's Prime Minister questions, the old stagers like Tam Diel of King's, told me it had been even worse before the cameras arrived, so imagine what it was like then. Now I found that dispiriting. It was rather like a really bad night at the Cambridge Uni. Of course the Cambridge Uni and the Oxford Uni are climbing frames for careers in the House of Commons. Nearly all the presidents of the Union when I was here, <coughs> ended up in the Cabinet, and would you be surprised, all with the same political party. I would hope that today's graduates from King's don't wish to go straight into jobs as special advisors to ministers, then be promoted into a safe seat for life. I would like to think they had some experience in the real world. If you ask yourself how we stayed out of the Vietnam War in 68 and against the blandishments of Lyndon Johnson, I would credit Dennis Healy, then the Defence Secretary, who had real-world experience as a beach master at Anzio in 1944. Margaret Thatcher, who was quite a belligerent lady herself, had to advise her to former members of the Guards Armour Division in Normandy, Willie Whitelaw, her deputy, and, and Lord Carrington. And they provided an institutional wisdom, I think, of the costs and casualties of warfare. I think it would be unfortunate if the principal qualification of a parliamentary candidate were ambition. And they all think they have things to offer and they want to do good for the people. But the ambition is very strong. Uh, and I would like to think we have a generation of MPs, and there are some now who've had a previous life in diplomacy in the army and elsewhere. I think the pendulum is swinging back. After I left the House of Commons, UNICEF called up. They've always had ambassadors, goodwill ambassadors and they wanted someone they could send to the war zones really to promote their activities. So they would send me to the places, well, shall we say they couldn't send David Beckham. Congo, Somalia, Yemen, I did 11 countries and about nine wars for them because generally I know how to handle myself in uh, warfare. Uh, it was a huge privilege. I'm a, I'm a devotee of the United Nations. I think whatever you think of its peacekeeping operations, its agencies are magnificent and I've been now for 16 years an ambassador for UNICEF. Unpaid, of course, the best job in my life. Being a UNICEF ambassador has made me aware of things that are going on in the world which we hardly 
know about. You meet kids who are recently child soldiers. You meet men armed with bows and arrows trying to resist the Lord's Resistance Army. You meet a 12-year-old boy who's been forced by, his, by the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, to club his own father to death. And you come back here and you think, what are the things we are worried about? How trivial it is. I think it's a kind of wake-up call of real-world experience. I always think back on this place as a little period of serenity in my life. And having been here, uh, I never took anything for granted. It taught me not to take anything for granted. So I think it was a great launching pad and I shall always be grateful.